Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, and Scott Hepburn. Coming up on DTNS, Jen Briney tells us what it takes to be a digital nomad, why some LED streetlights turn purple, and Twitter. <sighs> Twitter. We have thoughts. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 16th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And I'm very excited to have the host of the Congressional Dish podcast back, Jennifer Briney. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks for coming back. Uh, I can't wait to talk digital nomad stuff with you. It's very fun. Yeah, it's cool. And, and you're in the middle of a digital mo- nomad moment. Because uh, you're headed right to the airport as soon as you're done with this, right? I am, and I'm recording from a hotel room sitting on the floor. So. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that's how that's, it's done. <laughs> that's all you need Love to it. know, but there's more. We'll tell you more. <laughs> all right, let's start with the quick hits. HTC will announce a new flagship mixed reality headset at CES on January 5th. Its global head of products, Shen Ye, told The Verge it will be a small, light, all-in-one headset. The company also claims it offers color video pass-through, two hours of battery life, with controllers offering six degrees of freedom and hand tracking. No word on price as of yet. Yeah, about time MetaQuest got some competition there. Uh, the U.S. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, that is the name of, of a thing, uh, said on Thursday that for the first time it has gained access to audit documents on companies in China and Hong Kong. And the reason that's significant is it mean it means it may not need to delist about 200 companies from New York stock exchanges. Companies including Alibaba, JD.com, were among those 200 companies it was looking at. The China Securities Regulatory Commission said in a statement it will continue to promote audit supervision cooperation with the United States. The mobile games market may decline this year for the first time since smartphones became a thing. Gaming data company Nuzo estimates that revenues will fall by 6.4% this year to $92.2 billion, rather than the 7.3% growth that mobile saw last year. And back in 2020, it saw 25.6%. A lot of people are staying home. A lot of people are playing mobile games. Amper Analysis also downgraded its forecast for the year to a 64 decline as well, or $6 billion less than what mobile raked in in 2021 due to weaknesses in the U.S., the Chinese, and Japanese gaming markets, which are the largest. Amper called it a wake-up call for the industry. Good morning, industry. Uh, Seven members of the U.S. Congress, including Representatives Lori Trahan of Massachusetts, Katie Porter of California, and Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, sent a letter to a bunch of game companies, Activision Blizzard, Electronic Arts, Epic, Intersloth, Microsoft, PUBG, Riot Games, Roblox, Sony, Square, Take-Two Interactive, Tencent, Ubisoft, and Valve. They all get letters. Isn't that nice? It's it's like the holidays, a little Christmas card. Uh, Inside this Christmas card from these U.S. Congress people is a request for information about how video game companies deal with reports of extremism. The letter cites a report from the Anti-Defamation League that found a rise of extremism in online gaming communities and asks for details on reporting in-game harassment, the science of teams dedicated to those kinds of issues, and any data on disciplinary actions taken against players for inappropriate behavior, among other things. So the significance here is what has been happening to social media looks like it may be starting to happen to video game companies. Waymo announced that it's expanding its driverless car service to include airport trips, at least, you know, for now, a few places. Customers flying in and out of Phoenix's Sky Harbor Airport may now be able to hail one of the company's rider-only vehicles to and from Waymo's Phoenix coverage area. That coverage area is also getting bigger. The company is more than doubling its service area in Phoenix and also expanding its service in San Francisco. Hey, look at that. Actual cars that drive themselves. So, Twitter. Uh, we've been walking the tightrope here at Daily Tech News Show of not over-covering what's been going on with Twitter, but trying not to ignore it. Thank you for your understanding as an audience as we try to balance all that. The last 24 hours have seen what we think are significant events, but we're going to try to break down, as, as we always try to do, what actually happened, regardless of how any of us may feel about it. Since June 2020... A Florida developer named Jack Sweeney has run multiple social media accounts, uh, one of them on multiple platforms, uh, and he calls them on all the platforms ElonJet. ElonJet takes public data from the ADSB exchange 
and then posts and make therefore makes more accessible and easy to find when Elon Musk's private jet takes off or lands. Sweeney also runs similar tracking accounts for other high profile people. That includes Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and the President of the United States. He tracks Air Force One. Musk has argued for years that raising the profile of such information, even though it's already public, makes him and his family less safe. However, he has also used that fact that he hasn't removed Elon Jet from Twitter as an example of his commitment to free speech, even if you don't like it. Yeah. So on Wednesday afternoon, Twitter announced an update to its privacy policy and also media policy. The, these policies described what kind of private information can't be disclosed on Twitter, may not, in going forward anyway, sometimes referred to as the doxing policy. The new addition to the policy reads, live location information, including information shared on Twitter directly or links to third-party URLs of travel routes, actual physical location, or other identifying information that would reveal a person's location regardless if this information is publicly available. A couple hours later, Musk wrote on Twitter, last night our... A car carrying little X, that's, I assume, one of his children, in L.A. was followed by a crazy stalker thinking it was me who later blocked the car from moving and climbing onto the hood. Legal action is being taken against Sweeney and organizations who supported harm to my family. And that is merely where the fun began. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so, so basically, uh, a stalker jumps on the hood of a car. Uh, it scares a father. Uh, and that father then uh, uh, somehow causes the company he owns to put in a policy that says you can't uh, give out that kind of information on Twitter. And very shortly thereafter, Sweeney and his Twitter accounts are suspended. Then Thursday, several people, including many journalists at mainstream media outlets, you know, we're talking CNN, New York Times, uh, Business Insider, were also suspended. Musk has said that they will be suspended for seven days, though messaging to some of the suspended accounts indicated the bans were permanent. That could be a change of heart. It could be a mistake. It could be a lie. None of the suspended accounts reported receiving the usual warnings. Usually Twitter warns you before uh, they suspend you, nor did they receive an explanation of what rules they broke. That is more normal. A lot of times you get suspended. They don't tell you exactly why. Musk says all of the suspended accounts shared real-time location. Though many of the holders of the accounts dispute that, uh, all of them had either linked to or written about the Elon Jet accounts. So among the accounts suspended is the Join Mastodon account, which promotes the Mastodon Fediverse, which is an alternate short messaging social network similar to Twitter. It's one of it's one of a few, but it's getting a lot of attention these days. You also can't post links to many Mastodon servers on Twitter. If you include a Mastodon server link in a Twitter post, you'll receive a message that the link has been identified by Twitter or our partners as being potentially harmful. Yeah, and some people are suspecting that's because there is an Elon Jet account on Mastodon, and the Join Mastodon account uh, pointed that out. Thursday evening, several of the people who had suspended Twitter accounts found out they could still access Twitter Spaces, Twitter's audio discussion feature. So they started getting together in there and talking about all this, and Elon Musk joined that Twitter space briefly, said his piece, then left, and then the space stopped working shortly thereafter. Twitter Spaces is no longer allowing users to start new conversations or join existing ones. At least last we checked. It may have changed by the time you hear this. Uh, so <laughs> here we are. Uh, we're all caught up. Uh, I guess the only other thing I've noticed is that Musk uh, ran a poll about reinstating the suspended accounts and then deleted it and then did a poll with fewer options. Let's not dwell too much on all of this, though. Round the horn. Just uh, a, a quick what do you think about this? And, and Jen, I'm sorry to do this to you, but we'll start with you. What do you think? I mean, who would have thought that a billionaire with a massive ego to the point that he thinks he needs to personally repopulate the world would buy a social media company and then do whatever he wants with it? Like, it's, it's his own little fiefdom. And I just think that if we want free speech, we need to have an actual public forum, which Twitter is not. And this is... One of the symptoms. Yeah. So, so unsurprised is how, how you are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. Sarah, what about you? Um, I'm kind of with you, Jen. I, there, there is, there is a lot of the daily back and forth that, like Tom mentioned a few minutes ago, we don't always cover on the show because a lot of it isn't really a tech story. You know, we, we don't, 
really know what it means for the future of Twitter, people who use Twitter. Uh, it's a... Uh, it's something else entirely. And this feels like, <laughs> well, it feels like something else entirely, but it, but it does feel like, wait, I'm getting to the point now where I am watching people that I like and trust very much on Twitter who are more, you know, Twitter users than I am saying, you know, I don't know about all this. It's just getting too weird. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, we, we've, we've talked about it on the show that, you know, people will flounce out and then they'll come back because that's where everybody else is. And I'm, I'm just now sort of wondering where, okay, where is everybody else going? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mastodon is an option. There are others. Uh, there are quite a few others really. You know, I don't know. Go back to group chats if you really want to, everybody. But uh, we, we're, we're, we're getting into an era of Twitter where I'm like, okay, this is going to be really different. And it's up to all of us individually, uh, unless we're kicked off of it, to decide whether or not it's still a fun, safe place. Yeah, this this the this last bit about Mastodon links is the one that's really tested my ability to to keep balance. I I try to imagine not what are they thinking, but if they were sincere, would this would this make sense even if I don't agree with it? And a lot of what has been done, I, I could say like, okay, yeah, I, I I could see a world in which this could be sincere. So I'm I'm not going to get too riled up about it. Uh, up to and including banning the journalists. If the journalists all did uh, break the policy then maybe they should be suspended for for seven days and we can have an argument about whether they really did or not but there's there's nothing in that principle that's that's actually wrong uh so you know benefit of the doubt sort of situation if you're going to give it which i'm not saying any of you have to but if you were going to give it you could find a re excuse there i really don't see how banning all mastodon servers from being linked to and i've checked this myself i've tried to link to mastodon servers and i get the notice that it is malware it's not malware it is not a harmful place uh that to me is the one where i just can't i i even if i want to excuse it really bad i'm like that's that's just not i i no that that, that doesn't make any sense uh and you may laugh at me for taking this long to get to something that didn't make any sense but it, you know i'm trying to reach balance here and it does now really feel like uh uh, this is is just not. Uh, this is never going to balance itself out. I'm probably wrong about that. It probably will. I, I'm I'm sure it will. Uh, but it really, this is the one that finally got me. And like, really, just banning all the links to Mastodon. That's that really is just random to me. Mm. All right, folks. On our subreddit, we have a palate cleanser for you. KV87, thank you so much on this day of Twitter news for posting an article from Insider.com by Adam Rogers about why faulty streetlights are turning cities purple. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a well-researched article if you have some time to read it absolutely worth it we'll have a link in the show notes the short version though is that cities around the world british columbia wisconsin north carolina florida new mexico california even some in ireland have all reported that recently installed led streetlights recently over the last couple of years uh, suddenly started shining with a purple tint, which is great for fans of Prince or BTS, but maybe not so great for seeing where you're going. Yeah, so Rogers did a lot of work to figure out what is happening here. Before we explain, though, let's start with why we have LEDs in street lamps in the first place. LED lights are preferable because they have extremely efficient and therefore use, they are extremely efficient, use less energy overall. You get more light at less cost and municipalities love things like that. The street lights, cities buy usually glow at 4,000 K. That's a shade of white similar to what would be in a high end sports cars lights. Pretty bright. It's also the cheapest LED to make. So when these lamps first started showing up, folks had to get used to that change from the sort of sodium yellow to something that was a little bit more, you know, in your face. But they did. And then those lights started to turn purple. So why did this happen with some LED lights, but not all of them? Yes, it was Prince. No. Uh, first of all, white <laughs> LED lights are usually using blue LEDs. Uh, the blue goes in a yellow glass lens that is calibrated so that the combination of blue and yellow is just the right combination to appear white to our eyes. There are lots of different ways to package the blue LED chip and the yellow glass together. Different companies do it different ways and at different costs. That's kind of the key to understanding all of this. 
Rogers found that all the lights turning purple had been bought from a company called Acuity Brands between 2017 and 2019. Uh, this is the legwork that I respect here. That he went and like found out, okay, where'd you, what, all these cities, where'd you buy your lights from? Most of those came from an Acuity sub-brand called American Electric Lighting, or AEL. Acuity says... That what they call the bluing, uh, but but really appears as purple, happened in a small percentage of AEL fixtures that it no longer sells. And it has gone and fixed those for the municipalities that told them about it. Uh, essentially, the glass in the AEL lights was yellowed with a phosphor coating. That's pretty common. That's not the controversial part. However, the phosphor on the AEL lights was delaminating, a.k.a a peeling off in some of these lights. And as it peeled off, the carefully calibrated balance of blue and yellow stopped looking white and started looking like what blue and yellow look like when you mix those colors in Play-Doh together. Purple. Uh, so <laughs> the question then becomes, why did the phosphor peel on these? Tom, glad you asked. Uh, so phosphor coatings can peel off of glass if the LED inside heats up too much. There are a few reasons that that could happen, including mistakes in assembly, maybe mistaken installation. Sounds like the case of AEL, it was likely a problem in the assembly because it just happened to a lot of different lights uh, that you know were made around the same time. Acuity sources its parts from several vendors overseas, so you know. Again, might be might be a few companies uh, that that were at fault here. <laughs> if you happen to be a purple hater, sounds like maybe though they bought some of the parts based on price alone, without knowing how good that that particular factory's quality control was going to be, because they're trying to put a lot of lights in a lot of places. Sometimes. Uh, something that they seem to have rectified, at least in many cases. But if you've ever run into a purple light on your street and you say, huh, strange choice, why? Now you might know. Yeah. So it, they the after 2019, this stopped happening. So they obviously fixed this part vendor. Uh, they're not releasing any details about which vendor it was. I'd be very interested about that. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Jen, are you surprised to find that lights were turning purple around the world? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's it's just so funny that, you know, these we're constantly looking for the lowest cost thing. And it's like you would hope that at some point they would look at the lower price and be like, why? <laughs> What's the catch? And so I guess we're lucky that it's purple light and not just like no light. Yeah. And if you want to look right. at the silver lining and it's easy to replace. I, mean, I have but. to think that depending on where you are and what time of year, it could kind of be cool. It's obviously lights that are not acting. <laughs> yeah, it's not intentional, should. right? Yeah. But but I don't know. If, if anyone's sort of taken like a nice sunset scene with purple lights by the river, uh, do send it our way. Love to see it. Yeah. Uh, let us know if you've had purple lights on your street. And and uh, now now you can be the smarty pants in the room who's like, well, let me tell you why that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Phosphorus. Indeed. Uh, folks, if you want to hear us talk about stuff on the show, do what KV87 did. Let us know on our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Last month, we covered a story on restofworld.org regarding Malaysia's attempt to lure digital nomads to their country to help boost the economy. We talked about how a lot of countries are doing that. Wired has an article out uh, on Friday about Portugal's island of Madeira. Uh, Wired seems less than impressed <laughs> with that particular effort. Uh, but Jen Briney was impressed by her stay in a different part of Portugal and was nice enough to record a bit about it when we covered that Malaysian story a while back. Portugal isn't the only place you stay. In fact, you are one of the few people, Jen, I know who are truly a digital nomad. So we had to have you back to talk about that. Uh, let's start with picking where to go. How do you decide? So this whole digital nomad lifestyle was my choice. And so I kind of, since we started this, I kind of let my husband take the lead on where we go. And um, so what I have found is that we have been chasing good weather because it's much easier to pack for warm climates mm -hmm. than cold climates. Like one jacket to, can take out your whole carry-on. Um, and so we've been <laughs> doing that. And then we're also looking at, like if it's a busy time of year, trying to go somewhere off the beaten path so we're not paying like $400 a night for hotels. So it's, it's very like season dependent. 
What? I mean, I having having done some travel on you know what I would consider shoulder seasons, you know monsoon stuff, where you're like, well, we might, we might get lucky, you know, because prices are lower, but <laughs> we also you know might incur the wrath of weather. Uh, have you had any surprises? No, we've been really lucky in that regard because um, we did Portugal in the winter, which was really mellow, and then uh, we were in Poland for the summer, and so we had a couple pop up thunderstorms, which was. I was thrilled with that. So no, weather hasn't really been a factor. Um, there is one other factor, though, that for us specifically, we're also picking places where our dog is allowed to go. Ah, we okay. Do travel with a little eight pounder, and she would have to be quarantined if we went to any island nation. Mm. So even though the exchange rates are so favorable in places like Malaysia, our little scaredy dog would not survive quarantine. So we're waiting until she crosses the rainbow bridge, and then we'll go to those Aww. places. So do you, do you pick on other, do you consider other things like cost of living or how good the internet is or even language? Uh, so not language as much. I've traveled in enough places where I didn't speak the language to not be afraid of that. But internet is definitely a factor because both of us need it to be excellent to do what we do. And so we have found that it's, we're not picking countries based on the internet since, especially in Europe and we've traveled in Mexico, like the internet's fine, but it's hotel by hotel. So we have found, even though you get a less authentic experience, we are trying to stay in corporate chains when we're overseas, like especially Marriott's, because we just know that their standards for business level internet are going to be acceptable for us. And we also look through all the reviews before we book something to make sure that we can work there. That's a really important thing for us. Yeah, that that's a good, uh, good factor is, is, you know, does does the place have the ability for you to be digital when you're being a digital nomad, right? <laughs> uh, what about things like speaking of work, like documentation? Uh, do you, you know, are you able to do a travel visa, even though you're working from the places you're going? Do you, does that make things complicated or do vaccinations? I mean, COVID obviously, but, but even non COVID vaccinations play into this. How does, how does that all work? Well, so we're relatively new at this. And so the way I see it is there's 195 countries in this world. So we're just going to the easy ones first. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so what we've found is that on a tourist visa, the fine print says that you're not supposed to work when you're overseas, but I know the intention of that rules, those rules are more like you're not supposed to be taking a job from a local. Right. So like working mm -hmm. under the table to wash dishes, like that would be against the spirit of those laws. But me doing my podcast from the road, like I really don't even worry about that. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just been traveling on tourist visas. And so like when we go into the Schengen area, you can stay and it's Schengen is pretty much all of Europe at this point. You can stay in for 90 days and then you have to leave for 90 days. You can be in for 90 days in a 180 day period. So we just kind of plan around that. Like we'll look at our calendar and be like, okay, we have to be back in the States for this conference. So we'll leave mm -hmm. for three months and then come back for the conference. And we're just kind of playing with the calendar so that we don't have to apply for visas or do any of that work. And so far that's been pretty easy because there's, there's a lot of places to go in the world. What about driver's license? Do you, do you even worry about that? Or do you just so take have, cabs and public transit? We're big on public transit. Um, I would say more than internet, when I look at infrastructure, I'm looking for places that I can get around on my feet and on public transportation because the language isn't that hard when you're being a different language when you're ordering food or something like that. But if you're looking at street signs in a different language, that can actually be dangerous if you're behind the wheel of a car. Mm -hmm. So we do everything we can to not have to drive in the places we travel to. Beatmaster wonders uh, if you use a VPN, since you're always on these other people's networks. I definitely do. Um, I've <laughs> So I was using YouTube TV to watch football last season when I was in Portugal, and eventually YouTube caught on to me. So it's not working that well for mm -hmm. those purposes. <laughs> but <laughs> for like doing my research back here in the States, I'll set it to Seattle. And that way, Google's giving me the results that I'm looking for. But it's also great when I want the perspective mm -hmm. of other places in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so just for security reasons and for access to information reasons, like um, the Ukraine war started when I was living in Portugal and they made it impossible for people in the EU to watch Russia today on the Internet. Right. So because I had a VPN, I was able to go through another country in order to get the Russian side of the story. So, yeah, VPNs 
they're so useful in my life and I'm, I'm very grateful to have it. What about money? Uh, do, do you, do you just use credit cards? Do you, do you try, do you exchange money regularly and, and, and also related to money taxes? Like, do you, do you, how do you file your tax when you don't live in a particular place? Well, so I'm a Washington state resident. Uh So, um, I do. And what's great about Washington state, it's a zero income tax state. So you really don't have to worry about their state taxes all that much makes it much more simple than if we had stayed in California. Oh, that does sound nice. It, it's wonderful. And then for federal taxes, I mean, we just pay them. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's kind of a way to get out of paying your federal taxes on your first $200,000 or so of income, but you would have to be out of the United States for about 11 months out of a 12 month uh, okay. period. And anytime you're in transit, so like if you're over the ocean, even on the other side of the world, if you're in transit, you're technically in the United States for that tax day. Hmm. So to hit that 11 months, it's really tough to do. So I just pay my taxes Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, you know, better safe than sorry. Exactly. The one lesson we learned with money though, I mean, Visa and MasterCard are accepted everywhere and we have a bank account that allows us to, it's a a hundred percent online bank. And so they pay for the ATM fees, both the bank's fees and the ATM that you're using. Yeah. So that saved us quite a bit of money because overseas, like you can pay 20 bucks just in ATM fees and they waive all that. So that was key. And then the one mistake I made that now I know is that when you do the two factor authorization for your bank accounts, you have to make sure that it's not your phone that it's tied to. Mm. Because if you're staying overseas long term, Mm -hmm. most people, if they're smart, will know that you pay a lot less for even better service overseas. And so we always switch the chips in our phone. Mm-hmm. But that means that we can't get Don't the, have the same number. Oh, yeah. and then you get into, into a jam. Bank account. Yeah. So we've switched all those things. Um, yeah, I couldn't have signed into my bank account for three months. It was it's, uh, difficult. <laughs> wow. It's, sa- it's safer to use, uh, to use a, in, to not use SMS as your second factor if you can. It's just frustrating that, that some services, they just don't give you another option, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, but we'll talk about this more in the, in the good day internet as well. But last question for daily tech news show, uh, who is this for? If, if somebody were like, I don't know, should I become a digital nomad? How would you describe the kind of person that this suits? So I was describing myself to a friend yesterday as a change addict. And I think mm-hmm. that's honestly why I love this life so much is that every day is different. And even little stuff is exciting to me now. Like I need to go to the grocery store. Where is it? <laughs> like, So if you <laughs> like challenges, if you like things to be different, um, if you don't feel the need to have possessions. Like I mean, I'm in a great suite. None of this stuff behind me here is mine, but I'm always comfortable. Um, so yeah, having possessions was less important to me than having constant in exciting experiences. And, um, and so, yeah, that's why this is working so well for me. And I, I think I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. I'm absolutely in love with it. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jelly. <laughs> Very jelly over here um, uh, as a person who loves to travel but has done very little of it over the last few years, you know, as many of us have not. Um, I really I really respect what you're doing, Jen, and, you know, that that whole idea of just being like, okay, what are we going to do today? It would be different than the last. That is exciting. Indeed. It's very fun. Thank keeps you, Sarah. You, yeah, it keeps, keeps you feeling sprite. Well, Len Peralta has been drawing today's story, but I'm afraid he ran out of purple. So what did you draw instead of the <laughs> LED light lens? Yeah. Uh, oh, well, you know, the um, that sounds great. Digital nomading sounds terrific. But yes, you know, I uh, for this week, it actually is probably the big story of the week, even though you know, a lot of us kind of sigh and say, oh, what's next? but of Elon and Twitter. So that's what I drew here. Um, If you're familiar with the book, uh, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. (laughs) Yes. It was kind of, this was Elon's terrible, horrible, no good, Mm -hmm. very bad week in a way. He was booed by uh, Chappelle's audience and uh, the assassination coordinates and the rage quit and everything else. So uh, that's what this is. Um, If you are a fan, or even if you're not a fan of Elon, uh, you can get this at my online store at lenperaltastore.com or at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len. 
I also want to mention that I'm still taking commissions and I'm still taking um, uh, uh, orders for my custom-drawn holiday cards up until uh, Sunday. So if you want to get in on, the, on that, jump on it and hop over to Lent Brawl Store. Fantastic. Um, Jennifer Briney, also such a pleasure to have you with us. Let folks know where they can keep up with where you might be tomorrow or mm-hmm. the next day. <laughs> well, you can hear my main show. It's Congressional Dish, um, which is about Congress and what they do. It's not about campaigns. It's about governing. And then I'm also the co-host of a show with Justin, Robert Young, and Andrew Heaton called We're Not Wrong, where we have a lot of fun. We're nice to each other. And um, yeah. And apparently we have not wrong political opinions because Justin is snarky and he wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love how sometimes you'll, one of you, it could be, I think it's happened with all three of you, will say something where I'm like, oh man, that's, that's just not right. And then one of the others will bring my perspective in and then you'll all agree like, yeah, but you know, that's okay. We could disagree on this. I'm like, oh, it just, it's, it's wonderful. It just, it, it makes, it's an antidote to all of the rage out there. So I appreciate it. Yeah, it's my favorite thing about it. You can talk about politics without being mean. Yeah, yeah. And hold to your own viewpoints. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, We also want to thank a brand new boss uh, over on our side of the pond named Catherine. Catherine just started backing us on Patreon. Whatever pond you may live in, Catherine, we are so glad to have you in ours. Yes, indeed. I, I would like to call you Catherine the Great for being one of our supporters. Uh, that makes you great. You certainly are great. All of our patrons are great. We thank all of you for sticking around with us. In fact, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet, that we roll right into after DTNS concludes. But just a reminder, if you're not listening or watching live, we do do the show live, and we'd love to have you if you if you, if you uh, if the timing works for you. Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're all going to have a pretty great weekend. I feel it in my bones. And we're back Monday with Aya's actor joining us. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lamos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew Jay Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Modern video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luders, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Ayaz Akhtar, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Our guests this week were Will Smith and Jennifer Briney. And thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 